welcome to the final event of the um, Near East Institute's inaugural annual workshop on the Near Eastern Studies. Um, my name is Mustafa Chirakli and I'm the director of the Near East Institute. Um, as some of you may know, the Institute organizes a number of high profile events every year, high profile um, lectures and seminars. Um, but today is indeed a special one for us, um, not least because we just um, wound up uh, the first specialized workshop um, of the Near East Institute uh, on the, the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, our participants are uh, watching us now and we were delighted to see them engaging in vigorous um, academic discussion and sharing with us uh, their thoughts and, and um, findings on a particularly challenging theme, and that is identity and citizenship. Now, we are going to be having some uh, final thoughts um, on that particular uh, theme. And for that, um, I have two guests. Um, the, our first guest is uh, Associate Professor Dr. Nergis Janefe uh, from Canada, and she is also the Senior Visiting Fellow of the Near East Institute. Um, Nergis uh, Janefe will um, share with us some final remarks um, drawing on today's discussion, and then we will allow um, our special guest, and that's uh, Prof Professor uh, Rebecca Bryant, uh, from the University of Utrecht, um, uh, Netherlands, um, to, to help us um, to step back and to look forward, uh, once again, drawing from, um, to some extent, from today's discussions, but also uh, dealing with another uh, important theme, and that is uh, sovereign longings in an age of global mobility. Um, I will allow um, my first guest, um, Associate Professor Dr. Nergis Janefe now to share her thoughts um, about today's workshop. And uh, then we will open, uh, we will uh, allow um, Professor Bryant to take the floor before we open, of course, the floor for your questions and comments and discussion. Thank you. And uh, then we will, uh, allow uh, Professor Bryant to take the floor before we open, of course, the floor for your questions and comments and discussion. Thank you. And uh, then we will uh, allow uh, Professor Bryant to take the floor before we open, of course, the floor for your questions and comments and discussion. Thank you. And, uh, I believe we are experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, I'm not sure if um, my guest was able to hear um, my quick introduction. I believe we are experiencing some technical difficulties. Um, I'm not sure if um, my guest was able to hear um, my quick introduction. Um. Yes, I can. There's a repetition. So I'm 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 actually going to um, start introducing um, our keynote speaker, Rebecca Bryant. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Right, so I'm just going to continue and uh, we'll take care of the technical difficulty after my introduction. We are honored today to have uh, <coughs> Professor Bryant with us. And I also would like to take, uh, take this opportunity to thank all the workshop participants, as well as my co-organizers for this wonderful opportunity on this timely but very difficult topic. Um, as a side note of administrative nature, we will be in touch with the group uh, for furthering the project. So um, please remain alive 
in terms of continuing this conversation uh, in a more substantive way um, <clears throat> in the coming weeks. So our guest is, um, and keynote speaker is um, renowned cultural anthropologist, Rebecca Bryant, um, who's an expert on forced migration, borders, unrecognized states, and uh, she's known for her investigations of state and sovereignty with special focus on temporality, historicities, historicities and future. She is currently a professor of cultural anthropology at Utrecht University, and uh, <clears throat> she's an anthropologist of politics and law. Her work is focused on ethnic conflict and displacement over the last two decades, border practices, post-conflict reconciliation, contested sovereignty on both sides of the Cyprus Green Line and Turkey. Um, she has a background in philosophy, cultural anthropology, and she held uh, many teaching and research positions at LSE, George Mason University, American University in Cairo, as well as Boazici and Middle Eastern Technical University. Um, she has affiliations uh, with a uh, Peace Research Institute at Oslo, and uh, sh she's a senior research fellow in the European Institute of London, <coughs> London School of Economics. Um, her One of her most recent um, work, Sovereign Suspend, Sovereignty Suspended, um, co-written by Meta Hatay, um, is, uh, is uh, sharing with us extensive knowledge and years of research on the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, and uh, it provides an original analysis of how state builders um, try to make Turkish Cypriots uh, perceptible and recognizable to the world. Um, and the resilient strategies that Turkish Cypriots have developed uh, in return. Um, another work uh, that is very commonly cited is the Anthropology of Future, um, which looks at politics and politics of everyday temporality. Um, this is a co-edited work by Bryant and Knight. And there are many, many other pieces that you would be familiar with, um, as Rebecca is um, a very uh, cared for face um, in this particular part of the world. Uh, thank you and, and over to you, Rebecca. Yes, no, I unmuted. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that really lovely introduction. But there is an echo still. Oh no, I think it's gone away. Okay, great. Um, Right. Well, I want to thank the organizers um, for inviting me to participate in what was a really stimulating day of uh, papers that were empirically rich and um, and taught us a lot about uh, the uh, problems of post-national citizenship in the MENA region. And um, many of those in papers invited us to think differently about uh, and to theorize differently um, regarding mobility and citizenship in the region. And my task, as I understand it, is to kind of step back and to think about some of the broader questions that arise uh, from the issues that have been discussed today. And in particular, um, I'll be talking about what um, Nergis Janafe uh, discussed it earlier today as the as the potential transformation of the ethos of the ethnos to a demos. And um, you know, throughout today, this has been discussed through the lens of citizenship. Um, and my paper is going to take a step back and think about the the citizenship state sovereignty nexus that is at the heart of of such a pr transformation. And in particular, I want to suggest that um, such a transformation requires thinking, uh, a rethinking not just of citizenship, but of the state itself, um, and particularly the link ordinarily drawn between the state and sovereignty. Now I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Um, that's going to work, let's see. Um, Hmm. Oh wait. I'm going to try. Well, if I can't share it, and I may not be able to, it, it's not too important. Um, I can go on without it. Um, <clears throat> so um, 
my paper, as I said, is going to be um, t talking about this, this, the link between the state and sovereignty and, and particularly talking about um, the, uh, well, that, that link, it, it puts the, the, the paper um, some, it's somewhat of an odd angle to some of the other presentations today. Uh, and um, one reason for that is that, is that when uh, I was discussing the paper with uh, Mustafa Chirakla some time ago, he, he suggested that I talk a bit about um, a, a book that, that recently came out, <clears throat> which I am going to show since I have nothing else to show. Um, <laughs> the Everyday Lives of Sovereignty, oh, there it is, um, which is, uh, it's called, uh, well, the subtitle is Political Imagination Beyond the State. And um, in that, that edited volume, oh, now I can put it this way, uh, in that edited volume, uh, we're particularly concerned with what we call sovereign anxieties or fears of lo losing sovereignty that seem to be endemic to our present era. Um, now, many of the papers today have concerned the impact of large scale migration on receiving states, and particularly in the context of the Syrian conflict, though not only. And in, even in the past few days and weeks, um, we've seen growing anti-migrant sentiments in, in action in Turkey as Afghans fleeing the Taliban attempt to enter the country and violence against Syrians has exploded in Turkish cities. Um, and as academics, we often write uh, about the ways that migrants, uh, whether refugees or, or migrants seeking a better life, um, become scapegoats for a country's ills. <clears throat> and, and in the language of the, the Copenhagen School, they're often securitized. Um, as happened, for example, in the famous um, Brexit uh, Brexit poster that threatened UK citizens with a with a flood of um, of migrants slash uh, potential terrorists if they um, if they didn't um, vote to leave the EU. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, or then there's the, of course, the idea of the Polish plumber, the hardworking immigrant who works for for less uh, money, as always on call, but is accused. Of, uh, of taking over an entire sector and pushing deserving locals out of work. Um, <clears throat> so, um, of course, xenophobia and stereotyping are universal phenomena, but I think we can probably agree that they take on new meaning in an age of globalization and particularly global mobility. Um, in his uh, 2006 book, Fear of Small Numbers, Arjuna Potterai noted that the demonization of others may occur even when there aren't that many of them. Um, so for a Potterai, nation state minorities are the major site for displacing the anxieties of many states about their own minority or marginality, whether that's real or imagined, in a world of unruly economic flows and compromised sovereignties. So minorities are a reminder of the failure of the classic nation state project. And a Potterai argues that violence against minorities enacts some deep anxiety about that national project and its relationship to globalization. Um, <clears throat> other scholars have argued that most such anxieties seem to derive from the perceived fragility or vulnerability of sovereignty today in the context of uncontrollable flows of people and goods and information that have accompanied globalization. Um, of course, the pandemic period has suddenly restricted many of those flows, um, and even people who have privileged passports find their movements curtailed. However, I just want to remind us that the last couple of decades saw an exponential increase in building border walls and restricting movement, a phenomenon that um, Bashak Kale introduced in, in, earlier in, in her own presentation. So according to the Transnational Institute based in Amsterdam, six out of 10 people around the world today live in countries with border walls. Um, and uh, Wendy Brown, the political theorist Wendy Brown, argued in, in her 2010 book that this recent desire for walls is motivated by a longing for containment in an increasingly borderless world, as well as she, what she called, and I'm quoting here, the fantasy of impermeability, perhaps even impenetrability, that complements that. So, in, I mean, indeed, in the, in the pre-pandemic period, bowling was supposed to be a cure for public fears about sovereignty being lost or impeded or eroded. Um, after all, just a few years ago, promises of building a wall propelled a billionaire talk show host into the White House, and a global power like the UK peripheralized itself with slogans of taking back control and regaining sovereignty. 
And especially since the so-called refugee crisis of 2015, countries within the EU, which otherwise prides itself on borderlessness, have erected a dozen walls to obstruct migration. And people have wanted these walls as a way, way of taking back control. Uh, this also laid the groundwork for the vast majority of people to accept and even want the closure of borders as a form of protection in the pandemic period. Now, I, I see my talk today as a, as a chance to bring together a couple of different strands of my work that um, Nergis Janape just mentioned, particularly on futures in the context of mass migration and what I call desires for sovereign agency in the context of what many people perceive to be the compromised sovereignty of the nation state in an age of globalization. Um, my research of the past 15 years approximately has mostly concerned what are usually called unrecognized or de facto states, uh, places that look like states and act like states, but don't have the international recognition that allows them to be part of what's sometimes called the community of nations or the international community. Um, now, I began researching these places in, in an attempt to understand the, the everyday lives of uh, citizens of, of places that are sometimes called pirates or pariahs. Um, <clears throat> and I was initially interested in how citizens of unrecognized entities understand their state's stateness, as well as how they live without recognition. As my research went on, though, I became much more concerned to pry apart assumptions about the relationship between the state and sovereignty. Um, in particular, my ethnographic research taught me not to take either desires for or resistance to the state for granted. Um, and instead, I, I argue in two recently published books, um, one of which Nagis Jonafe mentioned and one of which I just showed you, um, that we would benefit from viewing the state as a form as a perceived vehicle for what I call sovereign agency. It's something I'll talk about more below. Or, or a bit later. <clears throat> so in addition to this, I've also conducted um, research in both Cyprus and Turkey on long-term and mass displacement. And one aspect of that work is particularly focused on how people construct futures in the context of chronic uncertainty. Indeed, um, as I think will become clear in a few minutes, um, chronic uncertainty is a topic that ties together both my work on unrecognized states and my work on long-term displacement. Um, and while there's much to be said about this particular topic, I want to use it today to think about the relationship between desires for sovereignty and desires for particular kinds of futures. Now, temporality and sovereignty are topics that are usually not brought together, except perhaps to look at the ways in which the past provides legitimacy to the nation or the nation state. Um, what to suggest today, though, is that social scientists trying to understand these phenomena, we would gain from thinking more about the future, um, perhaps especially when thinking about what people want when they say they want sovereignty. So um, what I'm going to do in the rest of the talk is just briefly um, discuss first why looking at the future is important for understanding sovereignty. Um, I then want to use my work on unrecognized states to think about what desires for sovereignty mean in the context of globalization. And I think that cases of partial or compromised sovereignty have a lot to say about the longings expressed by people who feel that their, their real sovereignty is in peril. Um, now, because I'm an anthropologist, and also because I couldn't share my PowerPoint, so I don't have anything visual uh, to show you. Uh, I'm going to start with, um, an, or start this part of the talk with an ethnographic example. <clears throat> um, in early March, 2020, most of the world was still trying to assess um, the seriousness of the virus that at that point we just knew as Corona. Um, it, it, was, it was affecting China and it was starting to hit Italy. Uh, but we, the rest of the world was still trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and in early March of last year, President Anastasiades um, of the Republic of Cyprus announced that he was closing the checkpoints between North and South. Uh, but in the islands North, where I was at the time, there was still a sense um, that the virus might not come to us. Right? And in that window of, of about... 10 days or so between the checkpoints closing and North Cyprus going to full lockdown. I went to a picnic with some friends of varying ages. 
uh, people began talking about why Anastasiadis would have closed the checkpoints when at that moment there were still no cases in the island. And at one point, a young woman in her late 20s, whom I'll call Begum, articulated what was on many people's minds when she asked, so what will we do now? My generation knows the open checkpoints. And we went to Europe, we studied there. Um, after Begum's anxious question, everyone at the picnic started excitedly talking all at once about the closures, about what was going to happen. Um, after a few minutes, the conversation kind of fizzled out. And at that moment, moment, one young man who was also around Begum's age, who had also studied abroad and returned to the island, and stared across the fields at the sea and sighed. We live in such a beautiful country and yet we can't live. And everyone in the group nodded. And, and picking up on this remark, another friend, whom I'll call Maryam, made what to an outsider looking at the scene may have appeared to be a logical leap, but which seemed to everyone there to make perfect sense. She said, we don't know what we are in the world, an uncertainty. And then the who are we question comes in. So this conversation then moved from a sense of anxiety produced by the closed borders to an expression of being unable to live, despite living in a beautiful country, to a generalized uncertainty and sense of not knowing who one is in the world. And the fact that to all of us, these connections made perfect sense points us, I think, to some of the fundamental elements of living in a place that the rest of the world refuses to see and whose citizens see their lives as abnormal and long for normalization. Normal neshme. Right? Normalization is what is supposed to happen after a negotiated solution to this long-standing frozen conflict, right? Where normalization stands for being rescued from a perpetual state of uncertainty. So what is abnormal is the uncertainty. Okay. And, um, and it, in fact, the, the word for uncertainty, right, is one that Turkish Cypriots use quite a lot to express the situation of not knowing where they stand in the world or where they're going. It's what defines their lives as abnormal, a kind of uh, what Hassan uh, Haag calls a temporal stuckness. Um, or as one former civil servant expressed it to me, when we were rising from people to nation, we got hung somewhere in the middle. Um, now states that have declared themselves sovereign but remain unrecognized by others who are often called states in waiting or states in limbo. And this label paints them as always kept waiting at the door of the community of nations or the international community. Right? Um, and as such, the description of them as liminal entities seems spatial, yet clearly the metaphor of being unable to move forward, of being hung or stuck, is a temporal one. Without recognition, the future remains uncertain, meaning that it's not something that one can expect, and many people complain that it never really arrives. Or if it does arrive, it only arrives as a surprise. Um, now, as you know, exceptions normally tell us something about the rule or at least what we believe the rule to be. What the exception of unrecognized states um, can reveal, uh, I think, is how much we count on the state to provide the ground for what we think of as normal lives, and how citizens perceive their lives as abnormal in the absence of a so-called normal state. Um, this link between the state and normal lives is one that's also been observed in places like the former Yugoslavia, where a growing number of anthropologists have shown that people tend to link their desires for normal lives directly to having a state that works, as they put it. Um, I'll return to this a bit later, but in many ways it shouldn't be surprising since normality tends to be defined through expectation. Um, as a co-author and I argue in um, a recent book, The Anthropology of the Future, which again was mentioned earlier, expectation anchors the everyday what we propose creates the normal in descriptions of its lack is being able to expect, where expectation defines what it means to have a future. Um, now that, that this expectation of expectation should be tied to the state, um, I think shouldn't be surprising since descriptions of the state, at least since Hobbes, view it as something that continues beyond the ephemerality of human life. 
right? People die, but the state goes on. Um, moreover, the idea that the state becomes the ground of temporal continuity in our lives seems to be one of the main reasons that we have trouble thinking beyond the state. Beyond the state is only contingency. Um, indeed, even, even critical political scientists who describe the state as a social construction point out that this sense of the state going on is an important part of the way that we construct it. Um, Philip Abrams, for example, argued that the state um, is a useful abstraction because the idea of the state allows us to imagine something that encompasses and, and it temporarily ex exceeds the, 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 the different governments that may change uh, or the political parties that may change. So those things change, but the state goes on. Um, or Timothy Mitchell called the state a metaphysical effect um, of practices that make a state structure appear to exist but one of the important aspects of that metaphysical effect, as he calls it, is continuity through time. So one might even argue that the very fact of having a sovereign state in the Westphalian sense is to provide some kind of continuity. Um, what Hobbes referred to as a kind of immortality, um, even though he noted that you know nothing is immortal, he said commonwealths, and I'm quoting here, are designed to live as long as mankind or as the laws of nature or as justice itself. Um, and indeed, a number of political theorists have argued that the whole point of a state controlling territory is to control time, and, and specifically the future. Uh, to, so to quote Liam Stockdale, who's written in very interesting ways about time and the state, um, he, he says the normative logic of sovereignty ultimately depends on its capacity to tame time by providing spatially delimited bulwark against the temporal tempor contingency, uncertainty, and mortal finitude lo located on the outside. Only the, then could the pursuit of the good life become possible on the inside. So as, it, as should be clear, it's precisely this lack of ability to control the future that I was describing earlier that calls into question both the stateness of an unrecognized state and the ability of citizens within it to plan their lives. Now you may be saying, okay, why should I care about unrecognized states or sovereign anomalies? <clears throat> now, as I suggested above, um, what we think about as exceptions usually tell us something about the rule. Even more, that, even more than that though, I, I wanna suggest that the chronic and systemic uncertainty experienced by citizens of de facto states can tell us much about our current global moment and more general calls to take back sovereignty. Um, and in order to explain this, I want to draw on some of the conclusions from another co-authored book that I published last year, um, Sovereignty Suspended, Building the So-Called State, which is um, both a theoretical and a historical exploration of state building in um, the Turkish Republic of Cy Northern Cyprus, which is, of course, a state that the rest of the world says should not exist, right? And in that book, we build on Jean-Pierre's discussion of the concept of aporia to help understand what it's like to live in and with the paradoxes generated by an, being a citizen of an entity that should ex should not exist and yet does. Um, now, the word aporia in ancient Greek meant an irresolvable logical contradiction. Um, however, etymologically, the word comes from a poros, meaning non-passage. So a passage that is denied or refused or impossible in some way. And my co-author and I found that the idea of the aporia helps us describe entities that I noted before are often called states in waiting you know, entities that are left for decades at the threshold of the international community. And the paradox of life in such states is that although they look and act like states, indeed, they're acknowledged as states. In fact, you see them, you touch them, they're there, right? They're not able to sort of realize that statehood through crossing the threshold into the embrace of the international community, right? So this idea of the state in waiting. Um, that so the passage here could be would be crossing that threshold, yeah. You know? um, 
So we call dicoethrenal call this the aporetic state, um, not just to emphasize this non-passage, this inability to cross the threshold, but also to acknowledge this contradiction um, of a reality, in other words, something we see, we touch, etc., that isn't realizable. Yeah, I mean, in other words, it doesn't become what we would call a real state. So this uncrossable passage between the, the real and the realizable, we could say is condensed in the desires of these its citizens, the citizens of this, this de facto entity for normalization, right? Um, for being tied to the world and having a state that others see and acknowledge and the uh, and released from this uncertainty that makes the future so difficult to plan. One may reasonably, reasonably ask, though, what we mean by realizable. Okay, um, and of course, in one sense, to be uh, realizable here would be to be recognized. But the question is, what does that really bring? If you have a state that actually does the things that a state is supposed to do, more or less. That could be arguable in the case of the TRNC. But anyway, if you if you have a state that does things that, that are that are more or less those things that a state is supposed to do, what else um, uh, does uh, recognition bring? Why does it um, uh, why does it uh, bring certainty? Why does it create certainty out of uncertainty? And here um, we return to my reference at the beginning of the talk to sovereign agency. <clears throat> now, as I noted before, okay, even outsiders perceive these states as somehow real, right? They're there. You can see them and touch them. It's just that they um, don't, can't cross that threshold into uh, the international community, right? Um, and so looking at such states, I began to see a decoupling of what the state does in everyday life, like building roads and cutting checks for people and, and, and what citizens think a real state should do and provide. Now, to, so to sum up a much more complex argument, which is really the, the, the subject of that book that I was referring to earlier, I'll say that what citizens say would make the state real for them is if it were an institution that made them perceptible and recognizable in the world and gave them agentive agency or a way to enact political will. Um, and, and it's in the sense that states whose sovereignty is actually in question can tell us quite a lot about states whose citizens perceive that the state is slipping from their grasp and cry that they need to take back their sovereignty. So in, in two recently published books based on this de facto states research, um, I developed the concept, this concept of sovereign agency. Uh, and in the, the edited volume, my, my co-author and I, Madeline Reeves, define it in the following way. And if I could only have shared my slides, you would see it on the screen, but I'm going to have to read it instead. Um, we take sovereign agency to denote the variety of practices, strategies, and future-oriented claims that co-constitute institution and subject in ways that make the latter politically recognizable and capable of agentive action. Sovereign agency in this sense is often more aspiration than realization. It's an aspiration to forms of institutional recognition and political legitimacy, legibility that enable efficacious action or what we call state desire. Um, the desire for sovereign agency in turn often merges, emerges from a sense of loss, a loss of political voice or political legibility or political order and a yearning to regain it. Um, and I argue at length elsewhere that this desire for sovereign agency emerges from the sense of not having political voice or legibility. In other words, being invisibilized, unrecognizable, and non-agentive. Um, now for citizens of de facto states, this is just what it means to live without the sovereignty that comes with recognition. So you are invisibilized, you are not recognizable. Um, you have what we call in, in our book, uh, aporetic agency. Um, but for others, the per perception of loss um, of that perceptibility or recognizability or agency makes it seem as though one has lost sovereignty and so creates this desire to regain it. 
Um, now, this idea of sovereign agency has also been explored by political theorist Patch and Markle, who called it an imagined form of effective agency or control in which you'll be able to achieve what you want when you want it. Right? Um, and Markle and others, other political theorists, have also described this as a desire that is always frustrated because it actually relies on what they call misrecognition of one's own circumstances or situations. Um, or as Charlotte Epstein put it, at the core of all human agency lies an impossible desire to be recognized as a sovereign actor that one never quite is, even when one is a state. So in other words, we can never really become the full agents we want to be. So the idea that we could ever achieve sovereign agency, either as individuals or as communities, is always a misconception or misrecognition of our true condition, they think. We can never really do everything we want to do, realize it in that way. Um, but while we can accept that, that conditionality, I think that, again, unrecognized states can offer us some insights into why people do things that seem irrational or against their own interests, such as voting for Trump or Erdogan or Brexit in the name of regaining control or sovereignty. Um, so in unrecognized states, for example, we can see how citizens, in the case that I've described so much, Tur Turkish Cypriots, um, become visible to the international community only to the extent that they deny the very institutions that are supposed to provide them with agency. So a very simple example of this is the way that in unrecognized states, hardcore national, nationalist positions tend to make those who express them unacceptable to the international community. Um, in the case of North Cyprus, for example, it's only by putting the TRNC in quotation marks, um, denying support for it as an independent state and sort of waiting for its dissolution into a federal entity that you can acquire any kind of agency in relationship to international actors. Um, expressing nationalist views or support for the sovereignty and independence of the TRNC produces what my co-author and I call an aporia of perceptibility, um, which is a phrase we use to describe how the the practices and strategies that are supposed to make de facto citizens visible to the world increasingly make them invisible. Um, and we describe this process as invisibilization to emphasize that it's not a literal invisibility, but rather a refusal of other actors to see you or to acknowledge you, or in this case, to give you agency. Um, and we use quite a bit the, 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 um, the book, The Invisible Man by the novelist Ralph Ellison, um, who wrote of the position of African Americans in the United States. And he describes such a lack of perception uh, by saying, um, I am invisible, you understand, simply because people refuse to see me. So as an, Afri as an African American, he was describing. Um, and also with unrecognized states, international bodies see you quite well, but they just choose to ignore you. So to be perceptible to the other is, of course, to be taken into account as a political actor and to have one's political desires and political will acknowledged as worth being seen. Um, <clears throat> now, I now want to return to the ethnographic, ethnographic example I gave earlier in order to bring together these two themes of future and agency. Um, in that example, my friend bemoaned the, the way that a lack of recognition created uncertainty and um, a lack of knowledge about who Turkish Cypriots are in the world. And because of that question, uh, as she put it, the who are we question comes in. Uh, because of that uncertainty, the, the, the who are we question comes in. And these twin uncertainties about both who one is and where one is going are very clearly tied to having a state that can't provide the sovereign agency that many people seem to believe the state should provide. Um, indeed, it seems that the lack of a, a normal life that should be provided by a state and one, one that provides a firm temporal ground you know, a way to expect certain things in the future and to have a future even, is often perceived as such a loss of agency and hence sovereignty. So the exceptions of unrecognized states 
I think, show us the logic of calls to bring back sovereignty in an era of global flows and, and states that can no longer provide a firm ground for the future. Um, the perception of some loss of communal perceptibility and recognizability and agency makes it seem as though one has lost one's sovereignty and, create, and so creates a, a yearning to regain it. Um, <clears throat> so while it's tempting to see the current resurgence of sovereignty talk and attempts to put up the, pull up the drawbridges and close borders as essentially about protecting the territory of the state, in other words, to see it in spatial terms, I suggest that it has as much to do, or perhaps more to do, with the state's relationship to time, and particularly to the future. Um, the links between the state and sovereignty and chronic uncertainty and identity are made clear, I think, in the lived experience of de facto citizens and others who have lived without the agency that one would otherwise expect the state to provide. Um, I mentioned earlier, for instance, that a growing number of anthropologists have observed uh, that in the countries of the former Yugoslavia, people tend to express desires for normal lives that they link directly to having a state that works. In other words, they, in various writings about uh, the, the former Yugoslavia, anthropologists have, has, have noted that the, the corruption that's endemic to many um, uh, former Yugoslav states and the, the the way that, that, that the states, these states appear to be dysfunctional, that they don't really work, um, basically may, is expressed as having abnormal lives, which is quite similar to what I was discussing for um, de facto states as well. So while it's tempting to see this, this desire for uh, a state that works as a desire for stronger state sovereignty, one may alternatively see it as a desire for effective agency, which in the past was always realized in the form of the state. Um, now looked at, looked at in this way, rather than asking why certain people may seem to vote or act against their own interests, we may instead want to ask other questions about the types of institutions that enable community communal agency and agentive action. Um, the general assumption in political theory is that a state to be a state must be sovereign, and the state and sovereignty are inextricably intertwined. But what if sovereignty is something that's not constitutive of states, but it rather inheres in them? Um, what if the modern state, rather than being defined as sovereign, was instead a vehicle for the realization of sovereignty understood as collective agency? Um, now I've argued at length elsewhere and in a and brief summary here that our approach to the state and sovereignty would benefit from disaggregating the two and particularly from asking to what extent the nation the nation state can or can not be a vehicle for sovereign agency and what sort of agency this is that appears to be realizable through the specific institution of the modern state um, this in turn allows us to separate desires to be sovereign from the state form Right, as well as to understand better what it is that calls for a stronger state, a state that works or that is really sovereign, right, express. Now, while all of these observations haven't directly addressed the issue of post-national citizenship, <clears throat> I hope that they've raised some questions regarding the sovereignty talk that's accompanied such shifts in citizenship and the institutional forms that might be necessary um, to facilitate the transformation from ethnos to, to demos. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bryant, um, for that fascinating talk. Um, I will have some questions. Um, I do hope that that, that would be okay and the time would allow. Um, but let me just double check if there are any questions from the members of the audience. Um, I want to also invite um, Dr. Nergis Janefe, um, but also the co-organizers of the workshop, um, Associate Professor Dr. Um, Noor Köprülü, and also Associate Professor Dr. Uh, Said Akshit um, to, to join us um, in this discussion.
Yes, um, welcome, um, welcome back, I should say, uh, Dr. Akshit and Dr. Kerpuli and Dr. Janefe. Um, now, Rebecca has um, put forward some interesting um, thoughts, um, both in relation to unrecognized states, um, but also the, the parallels um, or, or the lessons to be drawn from the um, what we often perceive as the unique features of unrecognized states. So I wonder if you have any questions um, or comments perhaps um, for Professor Bryant. Um, Dr. Jennifer, shall we start with you? Um, sure. I mean, it's always a delight to listen to Rebecca and um, the way she concluded in terms of contextualizing post-nationalism with a glance to it, um, <clears throat> the separation of statehood from agency, um, sometimes uh, not so desired, especially in conditions of extended limbo. I think these are very essential um, entry points for furthering the discussion concerning mass mobility and displacement and alternative forms of um, rooting subjectivities. So, so um, I don't have any questions. I, I think our audience uh, might have questions, but thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer. Um, Dr. Köprülü, uh, how about you? I don't think we can hear Dr. Köprülü. If you want to double check your microphone. I think it's okay right now, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. What I was saying is that today was an unforgettable day for all of us, I guess. Uh, it was invaluable to talk to the distinguished participants on the post-national citizenship in Middle East and North Africa region throughout the day. And also, of course, I would like to also um, thank to uh, Professor Bryant for being an integral part of this uh, fascinating event. And uh, she actually uh, elaborate more on uh, particularly with a case study uh, going into detail about the de facto states because as you can see the picture can be broadened and as long as we actually touch upon the picture we can see the other dimensions so this would let us also to have further uh, events uh, I mean clarifying elaborating uh, the, the these kind of discussions post-national citizenship um, and the interaction between the state and the citizens in a more multi-dimensional way. Um, but given that I have this opportunity, let me also thank to um, uh, Nergis Janefe as the actually the, uh, the ideational architect uh, of this event, uh, because uh, we actually started to discuss about organizing uh, this workshop almost a year ago and even more than a year ago, because we didn't even have this pandemic, uh, then uh, I would like to thank you very much to two of my colleagues, uh, not just for their kindness, uh, I mean, because we worked together for a long period of time, and I'm really uh, thankful for all of their uh, continuous support uh, throughout this uh, project to my colleagues, uh, Mustafa Çırakli and Said Akşi. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Akshit, any questions or perhaps some closing remarks? Thank you. Thank you, Mustafa. It was a pleasure to be part of this today. I mean, breathing in some academic air is, you know, uh, is very special, especially during the pandemic, I would say. I noted actually some of the, the issues that uh, Rebecca has mentioned, uh, specifically on the relationship between sovereignty and statehood, uh, which one is precursor to the, to the other one. Uh, in this sense, uncertainty and temporality. I mean, the, you know, uh, some of these issues, especially the temp issue of temporality has been uh, perhaps one of the, the main issues of today and imagination, of course, right? Uh, and, the, you know, we have realities and imaginations and it, it seems like that uh, we're going to discuss these aspects in relation to uh, politics and economics of this region, Eastern Mediterranean and uh, the Middle Eastern need, uh, region, uh, I would guess. Uh, uh, I mean, thanks to everyone uh, to who have participated, presented, uh, asked questions, uh, 
and who made this possible actually the, the whole day uh, and to the uh, actually people here uh, i mean the nergis as the ideational character you know uh, inspiring the, so thank you for that uh, mustafa uh, probably carrying most of the bureaucratic burden on that procedural burden and not of course the uh, uh, intervening in various um, uh, aspects in terms of attracting people from the Middle East region because the main target was the Middle East here. Uh, I I think I received mostly the benefits of this uh, and enjoyed it. Uh, you know, uh, I had the pleasure of being part of that. And thank you, Rebecca, for actually providing a very good uh, uh, speech, uh, keynote speech at the end to put a, a final remark to this uh, actually workshop. Thank you very much. Okay, well, um, I guess that brings um, this event uh, to a close. Um, just before uh, I go, uh, let me also um, extend my gratitude uh, for the, the co-organizers of the um, workshop and this um, public keynote uh, lecture, um, the um, Associate Professor Dr. Nergis Janefe, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Noor Köprülü and Associate Professor Dr. Said Akshit. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to sit with you at the um, organizing committee um, and it wouldn't uh, have been this successful without your um, contributions and help. Uh, I also want to thank uh, the workshop participants um, for, for joining us today and engaging in that discussion, this timely discussion and intervention, which hopefully um, will lead to um the the information and the awareness uh, that we need uh, in order to better um understand uh, the complexity of the region that we are dealing with um and finally i want to thank our uh, keynote uh, lecturer professor bryant um she she was with us um, throughout the day and she also kindly agreed um to share with us um, her thoughts and um reflections uh, in this final event. Uh, it was certainly a fascinating talk, so uh, our, a huge thank you also goes to her. Um, so on that note, thank you uh, very much for, for joining us. Um, do make sure to follow uh, the Institute's work on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and we are also on the Instagram. And let's hope that we see you at another event. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Dreaming